my name is Brad Miller. I'm the Northwest Field Office Director for Indiana Landmarks. Um, so welcome to our virtual logs to Lestrons program this year. Um, we're glad that you're all able to join us tonight and hope that next year uh, we can see you in person um, for our annual logs to Lestrons tour, uh, hosted in partnership with the National Park Service. Uh, tonight we'll take a quick journey through nearly two centuries of architecture in Indiana Dunes National Park. While we won't be able to cover all the historic buildings normally seen on the tour, we will look at the earliest log structures, late 19th and early 20th century wood frame and brick farmhouses, forward thinking experimental homes, and the modernist houses constructed of steel and glass. I'll do my best to stay in chronological order, but I'll diverge a little to show you how they influenced one another. Then we'll step back and hear from two families who had the opportunity to restore two very different homes, a 19th century log house and a 1940s all steel lustron. We will be sure to leave time at the end for questions, so please type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, this program will also be recorded and shared at a later date. First, I want to introduce Indiana Landmarks for those um, who are joining us for the first time. Um, Indiana Landmarks is a statewide historic preservation nonprofit. Um, we are membership based uh, and we also have nine regional offices across Indiana. Um, it's best to describe our mission in three different parts. Um, so first, uh, we have a mission of saving meaningful places. Um, that's the traditional sense of historic preservation, um, just like the Morris Butler House pictured here. Uh, it's the organization's very first save when we started in 1960 as uh, the interstate made its way through Indianapolis and local residents made their voices heard to preserve um, the beautiful Second Empire Morris Butler House. The second part of our mission is revitalizing communities. We believe that by uh, reinvigorating empty historic spaces in your communities, in your, your historic downtowns, um, they can serve as catalysts to revitalization. Uh, this is the Delphi Opera House pre prior to restoration uh, in Delphi, Indiana. After its restoration, the first floor commercial storefronts were opened up for business. And if you direct your attention to the third floor is actually their 19th century opera house um, that now hosts live events. Well, hopefully we'll begin to again host live events, um, bring people to their community where they, um, where they uh, patronize all those businesses. And the last uh, part of our mission, reconnecting us to our heritage. That's probably the most important aspect of our mission, um, connecting Hoosiers to our heritage across the state. Um, this is the Lyle Station School. Uh, Lyle Station was a pre-Civil War uh, free Black uh, settlement, um, and we were down there and assisted um, with the revitalization of that school and, and providing support to that organization, um, which now serves as a, an educational hub for uh, continuing education and jobs training in the area. But now back to Northwest Indiana to focus on Indian Dunes National Park. Uh, located at the southern tip of Lake Michigan, Indiana Dunes National Park spans 15 miles of shoreline and over 15,000 acres of dunes, oak savannas, swamps, bogs, marshes, prairies, rivers, and forests. It's a lot. With hundreds of animal species and more than 1,100 flowering plant species and ferns, Indiana Dunes National Park is one of the most biologically diverse units among our national park system. Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore, now National Park, was established back in 1966 as part of the grand bargain, an agreement to create a large industrial area and deep channel shipping harbor while protecting a portion of the dunes. Since these areas already contain private residences, the Park Service purchased properties with the goal of restoring the natural environment. Property owners had three options, either take cash and move out immediately, take less money but have additional time to stay, or take little money and stay longer. Many opted for this third option with terms expiring toward the late 1990s. The expiration dates offered little incentive for owners to make long-term investments in their properties. Thankfully, the National Park Service is also tasked with preserving historically significant buildings. They're able to integrate some of these as educational sites, but others were left without a use and without funding for repairs. As part of an innovative partnership, Indiana Landmarks leases several of the most significant sites from the National Park Service and sub subleases the properties to individuals who have restored them. In most cases, the buildings needed considerable re renovation and investment the individuals were willing to undertake in exchange for long-term leases. One of those uh, projects actually uh, coincides with our early log structures in Indiana Dunes National Park. One of these properties was the Goose Lindstrom Farm. 
Swedish immigrant Gus Lindstrom purchased the land in 1870, which already had the original res residence, a two room log cabin with loft constructed prior to 1864. The walls, descendants of Lindstrom, enlarged the house and constructed a barn by 1910. They continued farming and raising tree nursery stock on the property until 1941. Fast forward to 2006 and the Field Station Cooperative Preschool was bursting at the seams and looking for a new home. The school's environmentally based curriculum was a perfect fit for a site within the National Park. The preschool signed a lease with Indiana Landmarks in 2006 and completed rehabilitation in June 2011. There's the renovated building today. Renovation revealed the original log structure in the center of the house. Workers left log walls exposed as an educational tool for the school's students. The Dutch Gambrel style barn was also renovated as a classroom space. The addition of skylights and windows in place of the west facing hay door transformed the dark deteriorated barn into a beautiful classroom. The only extant log structures older are tied to the region's first Euro-American settlers, the Baileys. They arrived from Michigan in 1824, running a tavern, renting livery space, and providing blacksmithing for those traveling between Chicago and Detroit or Fort Wayne. Joseph Bailey, born in Quebec in 1774, was a fur trader on the Great Lakes. He and his family had significant influence as the region became part of the United States expanding frontier. The homestead includes the two and a half story com house completed in 1903 after Joseph's death and some of the earliest structures including an 1820 log kitchen and chapel, a circa 1892 story log cabin, a log storehouse dating back to 1835, and an 1875 brick house in nearby family cemetery. The last log structure I'll touch on today and we'll go into more detail uh, is the Oscar Irene Nelson site. So since 2011, the Shemansky family has been restoring this log house and outbuildings. Prior to starting, Mike Shemansky, a retired architect, and Pat Shemansky, a retired attorney, had been involved in the restoration of the Pullman neighborhood in Chicago. Their son, Robbie, who assisted in the rehab, also studied historic preservation. You'll get to hear about their experience restoring this architecturally rich and complex site later. The legacy of architecture in the dunes runs full circle with logs, with the Goodfellow Lodge, which was designed in the Adirondack rustic style. The exposed log rafters, oak floors, and bark covered railings were a nod to pioneering log structures. Built for U.S. Steel and their families, the Goodfellow Club Youth Camp operated from 1941 to 1976. U.S. Steel engineers designed the camp spanning 63 acres to harmonize with the surrounding fields and rolling woodland. In 1951, workers replaced the white pine log sheathing the exterior with horizontal tongue and groove redwood siding. It remains in need of restoration and a use. So along with the log and later wood frame structures, many early settlers of European descent transitioned to brick for their homes. Anders and Johanna Schelberg arrived from Sweden in 1863, settling in the Swedish community of Baileytown and purchasing their farm in 1869. The Shelberg farm stayed in the family for three generations and includes a house, barn, windmill, and several outbuildings. Unfortunately, a fire destroyed the original wood frame farmhouse in 1884. The Shelbergs replaced it with a Gable L style brick house the next year. Gable L was a popular style of the time period, especially in the upper Midwest, and was found in most architecture pattern books. This floor plan was considered efficient and economical. The Gable L was the preferred choice among the Swedish residents of North Porter County, including the adjacent Nelson farm, a different Nelson. Both brick farmhouses are attributed to A.J. Lindquist, a local Swedish builder. While the dunes certainly has examples of simple wood frame structures from the turn of the century, it also has an example of an early prefabricated wood frame home that certainly inspired the lustrons you will learn about tonight. The Peter Larson site, completed in 1910, is a Sears catalog house, specifically the Silverdale model, which could be ordered from the catalog and essentially shipped to your house site. As with other Sears homes, it reflects popular design choices and socially accepted housing ideals of the period. By 1900, designers reacting the, against the formality of the Victorian age emphasized clean lines, balanced proportions, and structural simplicity on the exterior. 
The house was rehabilitated in 2002 by the National Park Service and is now used by the Dunes Learning Center for intern housing. And jumping a few decades, the Beverly Shores Depot is the only building technically not part of Indiana Dunes National Park, but it provides an important tie to its architectural legacy. Credited to architects Arthur Gerber and Leo Post, the Mission Revival style depot built in 1929 remains as the last original and still functioning stop along the South Shore urban line. It was also the gateway to Beverly Shores, a new resort town founded by real estate developer Robert Bartlett. In an attempt to attract home buyers, Bartlett transported several houses from the Chicago World's Fair in 1933, including five homes now part of the Century of Progress Architectural Historic District. A real estate marketing scheme thus led to the introduction of a handful of houses that mark an inflection point in modern home design. The COP homes were constructed for exhibition at the 33 Century of Progress World's Fair. As part of the Home and Industrial Arts Exhibition, the homes were meant to explore new architectural styles, building materials, and technologies. Among the first forward thinking of the homes was architect George Keck's House of Tomorrow, which was a 12-sided all-glass wall house built around a steel structure. Four of the five homes have been restored through a lease partnership with the National Park Service Indiana Landmarks and private lessees, while we make plans to restore the House of Tomorrow. We hope to host our in-person Century of Progress tour this September, so keep an eye out for an announcement on that. And the coveted Lustron. It's interesting to note that direct lines of every evolving house design can be drawn between Lustron homes and the COP homes. The use of interior steel structures, prefabricated elements, and most importantly, the porcelain enameled steel panels that were first seen on the Armco Faro house. The Snells will share more about Lustron Homes and the restoration journey they embarked upon in 2006. They likened to a giant erector set. We're thankful Laurie and Steve Snell, an educator and engineer, are the perfect duo to see the project to completion. We can also see the newer materials from the COP homes, especially the use of glass to obscure the divide between a house's interior and exterior spaces. This is most notable in mid-century design and the international style. A great example in the Indiana Dunes was designed by Chicago architect Harold Olin for Dr. John and Gerda Myers. The Myers design requirements were modest, an informal house with an open floor plan, lots of glass to capture the ever-changing views of the lake, minimal disturbance of the dune, natural finishes to complement the environment, and an enclosed kitchen. The kitchen, master bath, and powder room form a compact utility core in the south side of the house so that the north side could be open with walls of glass. A decorative grill from Sullivan's Stock Exchange building in Chicago was placed behind the fireplace, becoming the focal point of the living room. And finally, the Portage Lakefront Pavilion one of our most new, one of the most newest buildings reflects the present and future of architectural design. The site was owned by National Steel and was used as an open pit dump to store acids from its steel making operations. After remediation in 2004, the site was purchased by the National Park Service. The City of Portage and the Park Service jointly designed the pavilion to meet the Green Building Council's Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, or LEAD and the Park Service's guiding principles of sustainable design by including environmentally sens sensitive sensitivity in construction, use of non-toxic materials, resource conservation, as well as recycling. Now, with your newfound knowledge of architectural history in Indiana Dunes National Park, we'll turn back to get a look at what it takes to restore a log structure and its many layers and piece together an all-steel lustron. Now I'll turn it over to the Snells who will first look at the Lustron house and then we'll follow that with Pat and Mike Shemansky. So please welcome Laurie and Steve Sh Snell. I will stop sharing my screen here. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Can everyone hear me? Good. Um, Steve and I are very grateful for both the Indiana Dunes National Park and Indiana Landmarks 
who had have the faith in our family to take on the Jacob Lustrum Restoration Project. I wanted to share one of the original marketing pieces that was published in Life Magazine back in September of 1948. Um, their ad claims, right there, next one, oh, next right, oh, right there, there you go. Okay. Their ad claims, um, sorry, I have to get resituated. Their ad claims that never before in America, a house like this, a steel house, a wave of the future. Their ad also claims for $50 to $60 a month, you could own your own home, a house maintenance free that never needs painting and a roof that lasts a lifetime. In 2021, our claim is never before has a lust run been deconstructed piece by piece and erected in a new location. Since we began this pro project, it has evoked a lots of curiosity among family and friends. So I thought I would begin with some of the most frequently asked questions. Why did you move the house? In the previous slide, you saw that the house was being, it was originally located on Kimmel Road and it was being overtaken by the dunes. So the National Park was, um, also had some thistle that was endangered and they wanted to move it from that original site. Um, the home had only one previous owner and it was used exclusively as a summer home. The interior was in pristine condition and, uh, and was exclusively used as a summer home. So it was very clean inside and over our process throughout the deconstruction, we met many of Elizabeth's property caretakers. Um, the other question is, is this a Sears home since it's a kit? It's not a Sears home. Um, as Brad mentioned earlier about Sears home, those, those were wood construction. This is mid-century modern prefab home constructed of porcelain and enamel steel. And it could be erected with three simple tools, uh, a screwdriver, a wrench, and a rubber mallet. The materials also were delivered on a custom design truck and were delivered all at one, one, one shot, one truck. The Lustron Corporation also cl claimed that the home could be erected in three to four days from foundation to turnkey with their four man specially designed crew. The other question we get is how many pieces are there? There are 3,300 pieces and we are happy to report that we did not lose a single piece of our life size erector set. What does it sound like when it rains? It really doesn't sound like you're in a tin can. It's actually very peaceful with all the natural surroundings of the dunes and the wildlife. How long did the project take? We like to think of this project as three phases. Um, phase one is deconstruction. In July of 2006, um, our proposal was accepted um, through the National Park and Indiana Dunes Association. So we began the deconstruction then, and by November of 2006, um, we had taken down all of the pieces from the site on Kemmel Road and put those into storage. Phase two is the reconstruction, which began in 2007 of all of the exterior pieces and the restoration of those. And then phase three is the interior pieces um, and the restoration of those. Uh, thank you, Lori. Next up, we'd like to talk about five major design components on the Lustrum to uh, ease you as we go through these slides and we use tech uh, terminology maybe you're not familiar with. Number one, all the panels in the house are porcelain coated, whether it's the two by two sections, the two by eight sections, the windows, the roofing, the closets and the walls. Uh, second, uh, it was made out of enameling iron, which was a very difficult to grade to make in the open hearth. And uh, it was there was a dark gray base sprayed on it and then an enamel uh, was sprayed on it with the color of your choice. Secondly, uh, as you can see in the far left side, these wall sections were made out of what I call an Omega fastener. It was basically a spring steel that was an Omega shape where you would screw in stainless steel set screws. And the farther you went into this Omega channel, the tighter the screw took. Um, and then there was additionally 10 different corner pieces that were prefabricated for the wall sections. Uh, third, in the middle of this picture with a light blue section is what's called a service wall. It was a double, it was a double wide uh, wall that all the uh, utility, main utilities came into that fed through the house. Uh, 
it was unusual because uh, this had uh, four removable panels in the utility room where you can uh, look into the uh, major uh, plumbing lines and also the electrical lines. Uh, the fourth uh, major design component I wanted to discuss was the heating system. You can see in the upper right hand side of the slide here, there was a plenum that was created between the ceiling tile and uh, cement board uh, that was airtight. And then uh, on the far left side, you can see that the furnace fed out into the ceiling panels into this plenum. And there was a series of ducts and baffles that channeled the air through the entire uh, surface area of the home. Now, in theory, the heat was supposed to radiate down and it did not work very well. We did restore this in kind, although uh, there is no force gas here in this house at this time. The last item I wanted to discuss before Lori begins talking about deconstruction is uh, the design prints themselves. Uh, there was a 162 page manual and for deconstruction, we started from page 162 and worked to page one. And, and reverse that when we constructed the house. But each, each large section of the home had a start, specific start and end point you could not vary from. And in this slide on the far right hand side, you can see a little arrow that shows start and stop on the two bedroom wall sections. So, so as we began the deconstruction, we needed to develop um, a labeling system on both the pieces and the blueprints. You can see some of the markings on our blueprint here. It was a trial and error of several different processes to get um, labels to stick with the, each of the pieces. We settled on what I like to refer to as the garage sale sticker method because this allowed us um, small labels that stuck readily and then color coded each of the rooms. And then we were able to do numbering and lettering system throughout the home. The deconstruction then phase one um, began in the reverse order. So once the closets were open, the interior walls then came down. You can see that we shrunk wrap the pieces here um, so that each set of pieces then would go back in the exact same precise location in the new home. In the utility room, the service wall reveals the electric and the plumbing. Um, so the electric um, plumbing and water tie-ins each had access panel that you could pop out so that you could do ongoing maintenance in the house. Okay, after, after the walls were down, the ceiling panels came down. The ceiling panels are the heaviest gauge steel in the home. They're four feet by four feet. Um, and you can also see here the access panel that you can get to the heating and the trusses. Over in this corner. We used a drywall lift to take down the large ceiling panels. There were endless bags of blown in insulation that also needed to be disposed of. The ductwork now is revealed after the ceiling comes down. Um, and this also revealed the trust wind brace system here. I like to refer this to as the tiny but mighty rods. They actually gave the strength and the integrity to the um, strength of the home, the shell of the home. Thank you, Lori. Uh, next, the interior was done, so we started on the exterior and things were really moving along pretty quick. Uh, Probably my favorite section of the house is a roof section. These are uh, 11 rows of shingles on both sides. They're kind of a clam shape and you, you start from the, from the gutter side and work your way up, pull on the clam side and, uh, and then screw it into the same Omega uh, channels I talked about earlier. Uh, there, you can see there was a big fancy ridge cap on this and this color was a brown shingle, uh, really beautiful in the sunlight. Uh, after the roof was down uh, and stored, we began to remove the first external wall pieces. You can see this was the south corner of the home. Uh, it had significant damage uh, from the dune moving over it. There was about 12 inches of sand, at least, on that side. 
Next up was the tr trusses. Uh, 10 truss sections are centered and bolted to the wall sections and the two, uh, there's two outer double wall trusses. We elected not to use any uh, heavy equipment and use leverage ropes and a three man crew. Uh, we'll discuss this in greater detail in the reconstruction section. Unlike the interior pieces, the exterior pieces were marked with uh, or paint stick. You can see these numbers on the left hand screen there for the plenums. Uh, the entire, th this plenum was an extremely important section as we found out during deconstruction. It was really used for the leveling course of all the exterior pieces and they slid very tightly in between the trusses and, uh, throughout the house. You can see there's a corner piece there that was specific to that corner. And it also held up, uh, the plenums actually held up uh, some of the uh, under pieces. All the trusses were split. Uh, they, they had two large bolts, uh, one on the top and one on the bottom. We split them before low, lowering due to weight conditions. Extremely heavy gauge steel, extremely heavy gauge steel. Uh, the last truss, truss on each side was a double section that created the overhang for the attic venting and also the small front porch. And they were particularly difficult uh, to remove. You can see on the left side, the size of that double truss. The, the exterior walls came down really, really easy. Uh, in fact, none of the bolts were rusty. They were all stainless and in good shape. We reused them, in fact. Uh, and we'll discuss how they go up in the next section. Here you can see the sill plates that the uh, walls sections bolted to with a couple of the uh, uh, sill bolts that would come up through. Also, uh, there's a little pile of wind bracing rods uh, in this section. Next. During most of phase one, we used our son's hand-me-down Chevy pickup to shuttle pieces to and from the location and to storage. Each load came down 17 steps. You can see the steps that went up to the original home location. Quite a workout uh, moving these pieces into storage. As of November 14th, uh, phase one was done, uh, complete, and the site was turned back to the National Park Service. 15 years later, Mother Nature has taken over and it's difficult to see the home was ever there. Next up, Lori will talk about phase two. So as we were wrapping up phase one, one of the biggest challenges was storage. All of the exterior pieces were stored in our storage unit, which was located halfway between our permanent residence and our, our Lustron site. The interior pieces were stored in the climate controlled environment in our basement, in our home, and in various rooms throughout the home. The trusses, they were tarped and they were stored in our backyard. We really wished we would have had one of those delivery storage trucks so that we could have put everything in one storage unit. January of 2007, phase two begins with a site visit with the National Park and Indiana Landmarks. The home was erected at the same elevation and the same distance from the lake for, from its original site. Um, we broke ground then on April 15th of 2007. We transplanted the dune grass in the surrounding home site before excavation. We had a very, very early spring that year. So the foundation got poured a little ahead of schedule and uh, we didn't have all the sill plates and walls ready to go. So we were a little bit of a push to get started. Here you can see the sill plates, basically sanded them down and used paint over rust. Uh, there was only one section that needed a little welding. Next. Uh, the sill plates were installed and uh, bolted down and they were grouted. You can see the uh, foundation bolts and the grouting. And uh, as the grouting cured, all 20 of the wall pieces were completed at our home and developed and ready for movement to the construction site. Although the original house was delivered on one truck, we took many, many loads. Uh, once the foundation was down, done, uh, we were working on various pieces in our, at our home in Velpo, trying to marshal and figure out which ones needed to come out next. Next. A little disappointing, but this was our Lustrum delivery truck, just a pure old state bed truck. 20 exterior wall sections and 10 pre-belt corners were laid out along the foundation and bolted to the base bolts and over the sill plates. Remarkably, all the windows made the transfer. 
Uh, they are all aluminum and fastened to the wall studs or the Omega studs as we called them. We elected to use leave them in as this is how the original lustrum was developed. Had a lot of curious people coming by as this construction part went up though. Next. Uh, next up was the fun part, the 10 roof trusses. The three-man crew laid out half sections of trusses. They were raised by leveraging off the current wall and placing the two center sections on a center scaffold. Uh, the upper and lower sections of the trusses were bolted together and then bolted to the wall sections. In the, in the wall sections, there was a groove where the, uh, there was a leg on the truss that would slide in there and then bolt. Very heavy welds and very heavy gauge in, in, an, in an amazingly good shape. Well, now this is starting to feel like a fun erector project. Uh, we had the walls and the trusses up, but the, it really wasn't structurally sound. There was a little bit of movement and uh, with the winds and storms out there, we were a little concerned. We did install a wind brace system, which was metal rods with spacers. And uh, it wasn't really listed in the manual at all, but that's what you use to center and lock the trusses and walls in the right location. Once that was installed, we knew we were, we were fine. It was, it was very strong structurally. On the right side, uh, it's very important to see, uh, there's the plenum level that we talked about that was installed and then the new refurbished gutters. So at this point, uh, you could work on the exterior, you could work on the roof or you could work on the interior. So we believe if you didn't have to recondition pieces, you probably could put this house up in three or four days with a three-man crew. Uh, the first external pieces started going up and we elected to start with the south wall. Uh, and you can see here a uh, window section and I call these the window, the window trims. Uh, there was four pieces always for every window, although the design of the trim may have looked different. Uh, and you would put the first piece in against the plenum then the two side pieces and they had pins and then the bottom piece locked in and then you put two two by four uh, uh, pieces underneath there. And on the far right side, you can actually see the screws, the exposed screws uh, before the next pieces go in. So the next piece would go in, it would be a blue two by two piece. It would slide into that slot on the window trim uh, with a rubber seal and then screw into that omega channel you see on the right side there. Uh, we began to finish the exterior pieces uh, uh, when, and when we weren't ready, when we didn't have pieces ready to go up, uh, we worked on the screen porch. So as rows of shingles were ready, we put those up. As rows of the two by two blue panels were ready, we put those up. And if we didn't have pieces ready, then we worked on the screen porch. Phase two was completed by the fall of 2007 and we began to enjoy the, the beach life just a little bit instead of uh, restoring pieces at that time. So as phase three began in the winter of 2008, so we uh, worked on all of the interior pieces that winter. So what was last out is now first in. So we insulated all of the walls, the ceiling, and then sealed the perimeter of the foundation with steel wool. This then shows that uh, we replaced the cement board with um, high R rating insulation foam boards here. So that's the ceiling going in. And then we, uh, this is the uh, framing going in and dividing the rooms up here. And then all of the interior is this beige color. All of the lustrons have the same interior coloring. Um, the panels were, um, two feet by eight feet panels or two by two, or they had special, the third kind was a special corner pieces. These are some of the special features in the Lustron. The pocket doors gave more living space. They had built-ins and closet overheads. So for the 50s, this was a pretty a lot of storage and a pretty modern concept for them. So 12 years later, here's what it looks like. This is the entrance into the front door. And you can see from the living room, you can see into the kitchen, it all sort of runs in. Um, again, this was what 
Life magazine really touted the, they called it the peekaboo kitchen, that there was a pass through from the alley kitchen into the dining area that then led into the living room. The bookshelf here um, on the other side is the vanity for the bedroom. This was 12 pages in the manual of how to put together in comparison to one page of how to erect all the interior walls. So it's lots of details, lots of nuts and bolts. Here is the kitchen. In the kitchen, um, there were two by two yellow panels. Um, Elizabeth Jacob, she had updated the kitchen with a Formica counter in the 90s. Uh, we were fortunate through the help of Indiana Landmarks to find another Lustron um, sink that needed to be sandblasted and re-enameled. So that is not original to, to Elizabeth's home, but it is from another Lustron. Um, and then this next is the bathroom. It matches the yellow panels in the kitchen. All of this is original. The tub was actually stamped in the factory in Columbus, Ohio to be the set size of the panels in the wall rather than a standard size tub. The vanity mirror lighting, the sink fixtures, uh, the built-in vanity are all original. Again, this is the back side of that bookshelf that's in the living room. So it was built in um, dressers, storage in the, in the bedroom. And so we began this project uh, with our family, three children who were young adults. And today our family has grown to over 14 and our six beautiful grandchildren. It is a special place for our family. You can see our oldest grandson, Noah, with his papa giving a thumbs up as he is learning how to preserve history. Thank you so much, Laura and Steve. It's, uh, it's an awesome project. And I know we have a couple of questions that came through that we'll, we'll get to at the end. And uh, thank you so much for sharing. Um, we'll now uh, welcome uh, Pat and Mike Shemansky to talk about the, uh, the Nelson uh, Farmstead here. All right, all right, all right. Oh my, what's going on? Oh it's, my. it's feedback. Yeah. You can probably uh, hang up from the phone now that you know we can start. Okay. Nope. All right. You're in the program. Turn let's see, beyond the phone. It's all set up. Excuse us for a minute. We're just uh, coping with these technical difficulties, which turn your phone off, uh, which we'll correct in a minute. And everyone can see the beautiful, uh, I believe, watercolor of the of the house behind the Schmanskys there. Pat. Pat. We're just having a few technical difficulties here. We'll resolve them in a minute and uh, get to. So if, if while uh, Pat and Mike get set up. You, you can hear us, can't you? Yes. We're hoping you can hear us because we have some technical difficulties and we're not hearing you. So we're gonna kind of proceed on the notion that you can hear us and that you'll be able to see our, our screen share here. Pardon our... Okay. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, can somebody signal to me if you can hear us? Okay. Great. We're going to go ahead and just march along. We can't hear you, so um, we'll try and do our best here. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'd like to share with you a few stories about what we've learned about the leasing opportunity, um, what we did to preserve the Johnson Nelson farmstead and restore it and return it to viable use. So uh, for context, the, the photograph on the left is the um, 
the farmstead as we saw it on our first visit. On the right is pretty much what it looks like today uh, after um, our project has advanced. So we've learned that uh, the community had a great love for the, the Johnson Nelson farmstead. It goes back to the origins of the Bailey homesteading uh, that went on in what was referred to as Bailey Town, which was largely a Swedish enclave. And it's one of the few remaining uh, houses from the Bailey Town. So how did we find out about this project? Um, when our children were young, we had a, a cottage on Johnson's Beach uh, about a block up from the beach and it was on a lease back which you heard a little bit about earlier and when the lease back expired then we were expired from our occupancy the uh, the house was eventually torn down and it's the property is now part of the parking lot for johnson's beach so as our children matured and got older they uh had this notion that we should return to the dunes so that our granddaughter could experience some of the joys of living in the dunes and being close to the lake and enjoying being out in nature. And our son, who at the time was a um, in the master's program in historic preservation at the Art Institute, came home with this ad and says, we got to go take a look at this place because it looks really cool. And it sounded interesting and the price was free. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So the fine print was that the house needs a lot of patching, painting, plumbing, and some of the outbuildings need a bit of stabilization. All those tasks we thought were pretty doable. We've been involved in historic preservation for many years in the Pullman area. And so we figured we could handle a little bit of painting and patch patching. Um, and we were awarded the prize. So the site. These are some of the photos that we took early on. Uh, we started with a strategic assessment of the buildings and the landscape, and it became quickly apparent that um, this project was going to need a bit more than patching and painting. The site was invaded by nearly every uh, invasive species that inhabits northern Indiana anywhere, and uh, an aggressive plan of eradicating these invaders was going to be needed in some cases to even see some of the buildings. Um, even the structurally sound buildings um, needed a lot of uh, immediate attention. The view from our property, um, unlike the other property you saw, had no lakefront view. We had trucks and trains. Several dumpsters of junk and debris, uh, truck components, a buried car, a gasoline powered saw uh, were all had to be excavated from the property. We filled uh, probably four or five dumpsters full of junk and debris uh, that we excavated and removed from the site. We had to use inventiveness because some of these things were heavy and there was no way to get equipment onto the site. So we used our, our little lawnmower to pull the sucker around with rollers, with rollers onto the end of the dumpster. In order to obtain insurance, which was required for our lease, um, the insurance company told us we had to uh, make improvements to the property. It couldn't look like a, an abandoned property, so we had to remove all the board ups and we had to paint all of the, um, the unfinished wood. And this was our, our effort to get insurance. We put shutters on, took the board ups down and put shutters up. Um, finally, we're starting to see some of the other properties, uh, other buildings on the property, but uh, inside of that building, this was what we found. So the, this was Oscar's shop, and Oscar's shop, the, uh, the ceiling, the roof was completely deteriorated, and you could actually, we took it out in shovelfuls rather than uh, cutting it out. Um, he was a, a kind of a little pack rat and had bits and pieces of screws and wood and all kinds of stuff stored in there. And this was Irene's uh, weaving supplies that were also fully saturated and everything had to be removed and disposed of. The barn on the site um, was in pretty advanced state of decline. Uh, we discovered that the barn was actually held in tension with a, a rusty wire that ran the full length of it. And in a very short order, the rust ate through the, uh, the wire and the barn succumbed and fell down on its own weight. 
the root cellar that had been described to us as a uh, caved in um, structure turned out to be not quite caved in. Once we finally got inside of it, we discovered that it was um, an interesting structure with uh, brick walls and floors. And as we got it cleaned out, it became pretty apparent that that was kind of a diamond in the rough, still to be uh, developed, but uh, you know, some members of the family think a wine cellar is in the future for this part of the structure. This little whimsical in, uh, incinerator is another of Oscar's uh, uh, masonry skills. It took us uh, several uh, passes of weed eradication to even see it. The final structure on the property was a garage that also had a roof that had totally uh, deteriorated and was uh, everything was so wet inside that the windows had moss growing on them. So our first major project was a new roof for this building and it became the swing space, uh, space for our construction. The interior of the farmhouse was pretty uh, standard. Uh, all of the original uh, products had been removed and uh, we basically were left to try and figure out what we were going to do with the house um, only to figure out that in fact uh, we had a lot of structural problems to contend with. This was the cellar underneath. And when we first came on the property, it was filled with Irene's can last canning, last year of canning until the raccoons got it. As I said, we started to discover some of the structural uh, difficulties that we were about to encounter. So we were not doing a redecorating, we're doing a rebuilding. These are some of the things that objects that we found on site. This is a, a 1920s radiola with battery operated. This is the, um, on the left is the original wood shake sh shingles on the original log structure, which was uh, subsequently covered over by new buildings. The spring is the, uh, is the gorgeous part about this property. It's, uh, it's filled with flowering trees, shrubs, fruit trees. Uh, this magnolia is about 40 feet across. There are several thousand uh, daffodils that line the, the property and um, there are probably 15 different varieties. Native uh, uh, plantings, this is a huge may, uh, apple field and trillium. And every farm has to have lilacs and hydrangeas and we have them in abundance. The first year we were on site, the National Park asked that we take one building and try to substantially improve it. So we took the smallest one, we took the outhouse. And as you can see, we had to do a bit of tipping on the outhouse, it was a two holder. Um, last occupied according to the calendar in 1973. And that was our first uh, building restoration was the outhouse. The shed was uh, another building that was in pretty serious deterioration. The roof was uh, in pretty much had no shingles on it. Everything was wet inside. But what we did discover was uh, some of Oscar's salvage uh, building materials. There were several boxes of vintage subway tiles that had been under layers of dark uh, walnut shells and casings, and you'll see more about those later. Um, well, I'm going to take over at this point, and it took us a lot of time to investigate the construction and conditions of the farmhouse. Uh, what we discovered that the, there were actually five different phases. The initial 300 square foot Nordic log cabin and shed was the first phase. Uh, the second phase consisted of raising the roof to create a second floor and converting the shed into a kitchen. The third phase added a smaller uh, two-story section uh, over the kitchen and also added a, the cellar that you saw in an earlier slide. The fourth phase was another addition to the north, which included uh, a two-story addition, dining room, pantry, and two bedrooms, and side porches as well as a cistern to collect rainwater from the roofs. The fifth phase was a modern addition, a bathroom, interior plumbing, uh, water heater, uh, air, which was installed in the area of the side porch and included an electric well pump, 
and storage tank. Here you can see uh, the, the construction that was used to raise the roof. Uh, in contrast to the log, they used contemporary stud construction or balloon frame as it's sometimes called. When that happened, they abandoned a window that was in the east uh, side of the log structure in order to install a stair to the second floor. Uh, there are five different types of construction uh, here uh, in this building. There's the, the Nordic log structure with dovetail joints, post and beam construction, which was used for the shed in the kitchen. Here's an example of the Nordic log construction where they have these very tight dovetail joints at the corner, and then the logs are hewn to a thickness of about four to five inches. They're notched to interlock and they are designed so that they could install uh, lap and plaster on the interior and siding on the exterior as they could afford it. One of the techniques for connecting the, the logs where they had to cut window openings or doors is to use a, a pin, which was augured and driven into a hole to connect the logs. And the same technique was used uh, for a pin that was used for scaffolding when they were building the upper sections of the log structure. Here you can see all three types of construction. The, the log structure construction on the left, the uh, balloon or stud construction on the far end of the future kitchen, and then the post and beam to the right. Uh, the masonry in the cellar was the use of Porter Brick, which was uh, a local brick company. And for the garage and also the uh, foundation of the bathroom, uh, it was used, they used modern concrete block. The garage is very neat because it's modularly constructed. Uh, very limited utility service on the side. Here is Irene still using the Indiana pump to get water from the deep well. Uh, some of the rooms were heated by wood stoves. And so we had to bring in all new utilities. Here we are excavating for both the, elect the water line and the gas line into the property. We also brought in underground electrical service, 400 amps that were first brought into the garage and then distributed to the other buildings. And uh, we were very happy to get our first modern electrical panel into one of the buildings and start using power tools. Uh, one of the things that we discovered was a, a modern septic system that was installed and uh, met contemporary standards, so we were very pleased to find that. Here on the left is the cistern where they collected uh, the rainwater underground and then pumped it out with a hand pump. Note the column on this corner of the side porch. What we found in the, in the barn were the posts that were removed from the building to create the uh, bathroom when it was added. They removed the post, Oscar stored them in the garage, and we were able to reinstall them in the exact position that they originally came from. Here you can see the uh, bathroom before it was removed and then the conditions following that and the post and the color scheme. Uh, the colors we, were wor we worked out with Indiana Landmarks and the National Park Preservation Architect. Um, the interior sec, the central section of the building was the most deteriorated. Here's an example of the wood deterioration settlement that occurred. And we had to reinforce and add additional raft uh, uh, floor uh, framing for the second floor. And then when it came to the first floor, we had to remove the entire thing because of the deterioration. You could see my son in the cellar and one of our uh, work crew on the porch. The door remained in the same position all throughout the project. And we needed some entire family help in building the uh, new foundation wall and our granddaughter pitched in. Here you can see where we had to remove the midsection of the building, uh, the log structure and the later addition were in fine shape and the midsection was the most deteriorated. So that became an opportunity to 
introduce new walls and um, reframe and establish the kitchen, which also included the addition of a bathroom on the second floor. Uh, the exterior of the, the farmhouse was old siding that was warped and checked and painted with obviously lead paint. So we had to remove all the siding and install new cedar siding for the entire exterior. Here you can see the contrast between what we started with and what we ended up with. We had many meetings coordinating the paint scheme selection with uh, Judith Collins from uh, the National Park Service and uh, representatives from Indiana Landmarks. And we came up with this uh, particular scheme, which was actually apparent in some of the very early color photographs that were taken of the house in the 1940s. The kitchen progressed. We introduced a, a vestibule and uh, keeping with Oscar's uh, salvage ideas, uh, my father uh, rehabilitated a building in Northeastern Pennsylvania back in the 50s and our family ended up with some leaded glass and we had to bring it in and install it in this uh, building to maintain the tradition. Here you see the subway tile reused as a backsplash in the kitchen. And here's the kitchen. It's very comfortable. And above we progressed with the addition of the bathroom. Here's the finished kitchen and it's quite livable and it's one of the favorite spaces in the house. Uh, the bathroom was added on the second floor and we were able to get in a skylight. And on the first floor, we added a powder room and a laundry room in what was a former first floor bedroom. Here are the living room photos. And uh, one of Irene's rugs, which we'll talk about a little later. And uh, the living room was, re I mean, the dining room was reestablished and we restored the pantry that Oscar had built in the 1930s. Uh, the upstairs bedroom, we were able to uh, preserve some of the last applications of uh, wallpaper and uh, provide a neat little bedroom for our granddaughter. So we were all done. That's what we thought. However, in 2018, the polar vortex produced a flood of 100,000 gallons of water flowing through the kitchen and along the first floor. Uh, it was a busted frozen water meter and we had to dismantle the entire kitchen and uh, sand the floors, take it all apart, uh, then re finish the floors, re-sand them and paint the walls and reestablish the kitchen as it was. So we had this house that we leased, um, but what we really found was that we adopted a family. Um, we got to know uh, quite a number of the Johnson family members. They'd stop by to see what we were doing and tell us stories about the house um, and about Irene and Oscar. Um, they asked to have a family reunion on the property and we were delighted to host them in 2013. They had members of the family that came from as far away as Dubai uh, and Southern California. Uh, two of the, uh, the family, the, these are Irene's uh, last remaining siblings, um, and they all enjoyed telling us the stories of how the house was used, uh, where they partied, their Sunday dinners with Irene and the kids staying there in the summers. Um, they also shared with us uh, family photo albums, and these are some of the photographs that uh, we were able to scan from their albums. This is Charles and Hulda, with the house in the background, Irene and her father, and um, this is Irene and her mother taking a walk on the trails. It's hard to even envision, but in that, up until 1960, there were no steel mills behind this house. There was a straight shot from the house to the lake. Oscar and Irene were industrious young couple. Uh, this is Irene putting roofing on the garage and Irene and Oscar working on the shop. Um, Oscar here is uh, using his masonry skills building the root cellar and Irene at the at her um, the place where most people knew her at uh, her weaving doing her weaving um, this is a rug 
that Irene made late in her life at for the first Logs to Lustron tours, someone who came on the tour dropped by one day and presented us with this rug uh, indicating that uh, she thought it needed to be in this house. Uh, more recently, the loom has been uh, reinstalled in Irene's studio and hopefully, we had hoped by this time, uh, it would have been totally restored and would be back in use and hopefully next year this time. Uh, people will be able to actually see and learn how the loom was used. A few more family photos. We'd like to thank the uh, Indiana Dunes National Park and Indiana Landmarks for all the help and assistance they've given us over the years. And we look forward to future um, years of logs to Lustron and actual visitors to, to the farm. Thank you so much, Pat and Mike. Um, and to Laurie and Steve, it, uh, it's amazing to see these houses transformed um, and to, to, to see them next to each other. Um, the log structure is designed and built by journeyman craftsmen who carried over vernacular ways of log construction from Europe and to the uh, meticulous pre-engineered structures um, developed by the Lustron Corporation. Um, it's, it's certainly a, a testament to the immense uh, legacy of architecture in Indiana Dunes National Park. Um, I wanna uh, take note, uh, it's 7.02, so um, if you have to, to leave us, uh, thank you for coming, um, but we'd like to take a time to uh, address a few questions and also open the floor. Um, I was able to f answer a few questions um, during the presentations, um, but I will ask a few, uh, the first one, um, is for the Snells. Uh, how many uh, Lustrons were sold? How many are left? If you have those numbers off the top of your head. Um, but I think most importantly, uh, is there a Facebook group for Lustron owners or, or what I would think is maybe a support group? Yeah, I'll, I'll share this with Lori. I, I don't know the exact number. I think it was 20, roughly 2,500 20, built. 26, 20, 2,680. Okay. Yeah, and we're number what number? We're number nine fifty one is the model number. Yeah, and I don't know how many are left. There is a publication of a book that um, does have state by state which ones are still standing. Yeah, that's what we kind of enjoy the tour every year because people that own a lustron will come and say, "What do I do about this?" or "How did you tackle this?" Uh, and had, have had a lot of great conversations over the years during that tour. Thank you so much. Uh, another question that came in for both couples, and we'll turn to the Shemanskis first. Um, do both couples live full time in these homes? Um, and, and how do you, we see that they're both uh, great places for family gatherings. They are, um, we, our permanent home is in Valparaiso. So we're fortunate to be 25, 30 minutes away. And um, our family has grown. So it is a challenge when we all get together to stay in 900 square feet, but we are creative and they're getting bigger and bigger. So we do sort of run back and forth yeah, between the two. Yeah, I would say that I would add that we probably spend more time now there than we have. Okay. Can you hear us, Pat and Mike? Yeah, yes, we, yes, we can. Uh, you're, coming, you're coming across clearly. Okay. We're, we're kind of... <laughs> we, the, the problem is... Can you mute that? Can you mute your phone? No. Technology just doesn't want to cooperate in a 19th it's century not log home. Cooperating. But uh, if, to answer the question about our residency, uh, we ideally would like to spend half of our time at the Indiana Dunes and half of our time in the Pullman National Landmark District. Uh, so we could say that both of our homes are in national parks. That's great. Uh, let's see here. Um, another question that came across was, uh, Heating and cooling the Lustron, is it all a mo modern system now? Yeah, we, we started with radiant heating and we had the same issues as Szymanski's, not the same year, but- We had a polar vortex. Yeah, <laughs> earlier, a little bit earlier and we lost uh, 
six out of seven radiant heat from the floor, you know, hot air, hot, hot water. Uh, we just recently converted to those mini split systems that don't require ducts and really a minimal impact on the house. It's actually laid out very well for a mini split system. And, I, uh, and we love it yeah, so far. Yeah, and it, it has heating and air, and we've had it for a year and a half now. We took a long time to try to find something to replace it just because we didn't want to put any holes. We've seen uh, other people that have put in duct work, and we just didn't want to mm. drill into any of the panels because mm. they're just beautiful. So yeah. it's yeah. worked out really well with the new technology. Yep. Uh, a question I someone did ask if um, you know anyone who would like a box of enamel panels. Um, so maybe that's something that you can go into that a Facebook group or a preservation list serve. I know that's um, if, if anyone does have any unique uh, preservation materials, um, always feel free to reach out to Indiana Landmarks at www.indianalandmarks.org um, and we can connect you with, try to connect you with someone who has the need, I guess. Um, love panels. <laughs> yeah. we, we are trying to figure out if we could build a, a Lustron garage. garage yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there were garages available some places. Um, we also see uh, we have a uh, great presentation from uh, from uh, park ranger Cliff Goins, who all of you probably know. Um, yes. I did have uh, another question for the Schmanskys. Um, if you could just speak to, you know, the structural integrity of those log, log structures. Um, you know, typically people think about old, old buildings, um, but it seems like uh, you trust them. Well, we took, um, can you hear, can you hear us okay? Um, we had to reduce some of the, the slides. We have thousands of them, but we had a whole series of repairs to the logs. There were quite a few of the lower level logs that had to be substantially um, repaired by uh, patching, replacing. And um, so it's not without some damage over time, but they're pretty sound. They're very sound, as a matter of fact. The, the, the log structure is, is really tough. And uh, we some of the, the logs, and so when we tried to, when we had to recite it, it became very complicated to to put battens, curved battens behind it so that the siding would be level. But other than that, I mean, it's very solid. And the oak has held up very well. You, if you come on the tour next year, you could knock on the, the logs in the kitchen. Yeah, that good old growth timber, um, always yeah. better than what we have today. Um, I will ask one last question here, um, which is, since we know how much uh, Maintenance, maintenance is typically needed with wood, um, but how maintenance free is the Lustron now? I would say that's the thing that we appreciate most. Very, very little maintenance. For the most part, the work on the home is uh, inspections, uh, just to make sure that you don't have any issues brewing too much. But basically we wash it down. Uh, we wash the walls and ceiling down every year, around this time of year, and then we wash the outside. And, and that was one of the things we were concerned about getting the heating in. There were a few years that there wasn't heating and we were afraid that it was going to really um, degrade the interior because the kitchen cabinets are, are the thinnest grade of the, and that's the only place that you see the wear and tears in, yeah, the, in the kitchen because it's mm -hmm. the lowest grade of steel in thickness. But as far as the walls and the siding and the roof, Pretty. I mean, it, those uh, one shingle I mean, it is pretty heavy. I've never weighed one, but they are like moving a car door. <laughs> I, I would say 90% of the maintenance is done on the screen porch, which we build out of wood. I mean, that kind of, <laughs> that kind of sums it up for me. You know, it's gotta be painted every, that, that beach environment's a tough environment, especially where we're at, it's pretty windy. You get a lot of sandblasting and that paint just deteriorates it. You know, you need, and the, the, the wood structure needs a lot of work. The screen porch is a replica of what um, Elizabeth Jacob had. And um, three or four lustrums we've seen the same builder from back in the 50s made them. So it has a flat roof, which also yeah, makes it a more high maintenance. Yeah. The maintenance of the, of the uh, log structure with the cedar siding is, is pretty good. I mean, the cedar siding is durable. We primed it, paint, painted it. And it's the only thing that requires a little more maintenance is some of the modern wood. 
that isn't as sturdy <laughs> <That's> as, <laughs> as so, the old growth stuff. But uh, otherwise, it's the maintenance is no different than a, a normal house. We do have to wash it down uh, in the spring because of the the dirt that comes from the steel plants, you know, and the highway activity. But otherwise, you know, we really enjoy it out there. The landscape is is fun and quite pleasant. Well, thank you both so much. Um, with, without your uh, hard work and determination, uh, both of these properties may very well um, be still left unrestored. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you all of you, everyone who joined us. Um, please continue to look out for other events in the future. Um, right now we, set, we have a QR code up to look, uh, if you're interested in learning more about the buildings on the Log Celestrons tour, um, as well as Hopefully next year in May 2021 um, or 2022, um, we can welcome everyone out to the to the homes again. Um, otherwise, please take care and good night.